Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and this is uh, this is interesting. Yesterday, I had the I finally got to um, speak with Stephen Naryoff. Now, I met with with Naryoff in my this. I met with him. It's important. I met with him in my legal capacity as an agent and investigator of the Deaton Law Firm. And I'm going to expound on that and my meeting with him in the uh, once we go into the, the private uh, group. <laughs> It'll be pretty darn interesting. Now I want to start here. This is this whole thing is a listen. In fact, um, this woman starts out by talking about the Ripple case. This is digital assets, cryptocurrency, regulation, and enforcement of exchanges, lending, NFTs, and more. This woman on the end here is with the SEC. She's with the Crypto Assets and Cyber Unit of the SEC, Kristen Pauly. She talks about how they're going after all of it. Lending, um, NFTs, anything basically around crypto. She doesn't address it, but even though you can go to Consensus's website and they're doing every pretty much uh, most of the things that she says that the SEC is going after people for, but they're not going after Consensus or anybody around Ethereum. They're allowed to do all the things that they go after everybody else for, <laughs> as I sit here still. But that's not what I want to play for you. A part of the, a part for, for years, a big part of the whole uh, thing about whether a crypto is a security is is whether you're making money off of the effort, efforts of other. In other words, whether these crypto prices are going up based on the um, the efforts of others. This guy right here on the end is named Abe Chernin. He's vice president of Cornerstone Research, and he has researched what it is that what it is that most affects the prices of cryptocurrencies. Any of us that hold XRP know that one of the biggest frustrations for people has always been that the price doesn't move up with news and all those different things. Hence, it can't be security. It's not moving up on the efforts of Ripple. But this is a very interesting clip. Listen to what he says because, and she, she, the SEC official actually makes a comment about how if you can link the price increases to the, those efforts of others, then that's, that adds to the fact that it's probably a security. But listen, but it's interesting just the stuff, because he's done a study on what does affect prices in crypto and what has in the past. Is um, regulatory, a regulatory event? Sure. And just for, I am also interested to see what happens, what arises from the, the, the... There's one other part of this. The SEC, who... Their whole mission is pr to protect investors. With crypto, they have been letting all of these people issue all of these things and letting these things live out in the world just like they did with, with Ripple. For eight years, they didn't do anything. They were even meeting with them, letting investors buy it, and then they sue them. And so I would, I would, I would say to you that the thing that affects price more than anything to the downside side is the SEC itself who's supposed to be protecting the people that they're hurting by killing the price after they let them hold the thing for eight years or however long. So listen to what he says. The crypto lending, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Uh, but going back to the question, so uh, I actually looked at two test cases for this type of thought experiment. I, uh, you heard about Bittrex, which is a, a SEC brought a case against the US exchange. And then there was an insider trading case brought against the next product manager at Coinbase, which is what we're calling the Y case. And those cases are useful for this type of exercise because they, they, the complaints specifically listed uh, six and nine tokens that they believed to be securities that were being uh, uh, sold through these exchange, exchanges and et cetera. And six and nine tokens is a good number because uh, there are not so many at issue that it's challenging to disaggregate any price movement of those tokens from the overall cryptocurrency market. 
so looking at these two cases as proxies, there's a, there's a uh, finding that is perhaps uh, less than intuitive. Uh, we do not observe lasting negative token specific price movements immediately after these suits are filed against platforms. These big public Maybe lawsuits against, against platforms, platforms but not can and often do like affect crypto prices market wide. You know, these are because of concerns about adoption of the technology, fears of in increased regulatory scrutiny across the, across the industry, et cetera. But it is really hard to identify an immediate negative impact on individual token prices when they're named in a lawsuit against a, some sort of platform. So it may be counterintuitive to some. It's actually not that surprising to me because we've noticed over the years that in general, token prices are very highly coordinated, co correlated with one another, even when there's a big token specific news event. Um, we've seen crypto t token prices move the most on days when events occur around general demand and adoption of the technology. For example, the day that China banned uh, crypto transactions, the whole market, the whole market uh, tanked. And on those days, everything moves together at once. Um, so we have seen across a large cross section of tokens, Imagine not that. just the six and nine. And Imagine that. That country that keeps popping up with the, with the uh, first letter C that we don't talk about on this channel, but we do talk about in the in the private group. That country. Imagine that. That they, when they announce something, that's what affects crypto prices most. Imagine that. And under every single rock, you find them in these uh, particular litigations that the days when a token's returns are significantly different than the market, it's generally divorced from the news of the tick token issuer itself, but rather through the, because of the health and the strength of the underlying protocol. So what might explain this? Why, why is this the case? Um, first, uh, with traditional equities, the factors that drive prices tend to be a company's profits, growth, and just general overall financial health. So in this equities world we're all used to, one would expect adverse company news like a lawsuit to move prices downwards, and then positive news would move those prices upwards. However, with many tokens, with goals you know, of a robust decentralized network of users, there are factors that are outside of traditional financial metrics that can indicate the overall health and strength of the protocol. So with tokens, issues like network addresses, number of nodes, scalability and adoption of the network are things that actually matter a lot and have outsized importance in this world. Um, I wonder if he did a study on how the price is affected when Bill Hinman goes to a podium and says that this one and this one are not securities, but the rest of them we don't know yet, and leaves it that way for three to four years. Where's that study? And so those things are not necessarily an issue uh, when, when the tokens are identified in a suit like SEC versus Bittrex. Uh, secondly, uh, quickly, uh, with traditional U.S. equities, if you want to buy, for example, Apple stock, you got to go to NASDAQ, right? There's, there's, there's pretty much one, one big player in town. So any lawsuit against NASDAQ, that, which puts the ability to sell Apple stock at risk, may have a significant impact on Apple's liquidity. I'm not going to keep playing it. You ought to go watch this. It's Docket Media is where you can go find this. And they do, like in the early part, she does a whole thing on the Ripple case findings and all of that. I wanted to cover some other things. Eleanor Terrett. Oversight Committee Chair, um, but the, the thing to get out of this is the thing that affects prices more than anything is when a country like China announces a ban, even though it's fake, they've announced it like six or seven times, or a, gov a government itself uh, makes people think they're going to ban it. That's what affects prices the most. You think there's been any manipulation? Speaking of manipulation, Gary Gensler. New Oversight Committee Chairman J James Comer threatens subpoena power over Gary Gensler and SEC in the latest letter. He cites 24G. Do it. Quit talking about it. That's what I say. Then we got today is a what watershed moment, folks. That's a thumbnail. For spot Bitcoin ETF, if the SEC chooses not to appeal the court's decision in the Grayscale case, it's essentially a clear green light for eventual approval. Will Gary give the thumbs up? Um, checking in from day one, Uber Connect. This is Ripple. They're in Toronto with scholars, researchers, and industry leaders across the globe for, with Uber. This is the University Blockchain Research Initiative. You can actually go to Uber Connect to check that out. Stuart Alderati's there. 
Um, he's, he's in town for Ripple e Reconnect. It's incredible to see global blockchain and engineering academic talent coming together via this program. Thanks to Professor George Moxery. I'm sorry, George, I probably butchered your name. Hosting a thoughtful fireside chat. And then um, Ripple had tweeted this out about calling all builders and they're hiring. Um, looks like Mataco they're hiring for. And then I could not, I do not remember ever seeing this video before. Maybe it's an old one, I don't know, but Riz XRP is always on the ball and he put this well, out. I, I fundamentally believe that where crypto is headed, where blockchain is headed, is for a lot of macro factors, the wind is at our back. And, you know, where we, if we just look at profitability today, yeah, it's, it's a lot harder to have a profitable business with, you know, less liquidity today, prices where they are, that's harder. But if you look at where I think the world is going to be a little bit further out, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about what, what that looks like. Call me the optimist. Call me naive. Call me all those things. But I've been more right than I've been wrong. I mean, Ripple's in a very good position. So uh, I, I feel good about that bet. And we're going to continue to invest and hire more people and acquire more companies uh, because I believe where the world is going. Okay. I, I, um, now... We got this. Um, this was uh, Jungle Link uh, 2.0 because Jungle Link also had his um, X account taken down. Um, says Charles Hoskinson says ETHGATE was simple, unequal application, which he doesn't see anything wrong with. David Schwartz says, I would argue that a government actor showing favoritism aligned with the personal interest of themselves and their friends is corruption. Yes. You know what I've always wondered about Charles Hoskinson? is how did he afford that huge Colorado ranch that he's always talking about? He's always sunny in Colorado, not Earth. I think he says that. How did he buy the Colorado ranch? He says he didn't get Ethereum. Did he get Cardano when it was issued? Now, this is where I leave you. Now, I want to remind everybody, I did speak with Stephen Narioff yesterday. He did not give me anything. I don't have any of his information. I did meet with him in my legal capacity as an agent and investigator of the Deaton Law Firm. That matters, but this is where I leave you. And since it's Friday and you're in my group, listen up. We're the good guys. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family that we were right, maybe more right than we thought, and we are the good guys. Thanks for listening.